E-cigarettes were first sold in the United States in 2007. These battery-operated devices heat a liquid made of flavorings and other chemicals, including some with high levels of nicotine, to make an aerosol that users inhale into their lungs. Recent studies show there has been a dramatic increase in their usage. In fact, data from 2017 found that 1 million youths in the United States aged 14 to 17 years old became new daily tobacco users within the past two years. And by 2019, more than three quarters of these youths were vaping e-cigarettes daily. Joining me to discuss how this surge in use affects personal and public health are Dr. John Pierce and Dr. Laura Crotty Alexander. Dr. Pierce, can you give us a historical perspective on cigarette and e-cigarette use? How did we get here? Tobacco has been used ever since the start of the United States, or way before then, uh, with the European colonization. Uh, the cigarettes beca started becoming popular in 1911 and, and they were given out free during the wars and we had a major epidemic uh, with 60% of men smoking uh, at one stage. Uh, 1964 was the time that uh, the public health movement consolidated around and agreed the evidence was causal that smoking, smoking caused lung cancer uh, and later heart disease and respiratory disease. Uh, in the 80s, uh, public health action led to comprehensive tobacco control programs at the state levels, and we started seeing a major decline in smoking, uh, and um, particularly in kids uh, after 98. And so uh, smoking levels in, in high school seniors dropped from about 30% down to about 6%, a major decline uh, until until it, and there was no nicotine replacement of it. It was just, they weren't doing it. Uh, and then around 2014, e-cigarettes came on and we had this huge surge in uh, e-cigarette use in high school uh, kids. It, uh, it went from the 6% level back up to 30%, uh, which has, has got everyone concerned about it. And particularly the, the high nicotine e-cigarettes because uh, the kids were becoming addicted. Yeah. So, John, what were some of the external contributing factors to this development? One of the main ones is the uh, when e-cigarettes came on, the FDA decided that they didn't have to restrict advertising like they did for cigarettes. It, it, cigarette advertising was banned. Uh, well, uh, a lot of it was anything aimed at kids was banned in '98. Um, as part of the master settlement agreement, of, uh, and the, uh, but they decided that uh, it would be okay for e-cigarettes to advertise at kids, and they did. <laughs> well, Laura, how have these devices evolved over time? Yes, yeah, so it's been really fascinating from a scientific perspective to see the rapid evolution of these devices. As John was alluding to, the cigarette really came to be in the 1880s and didn't really change much over the last 140 years. Like they look very similar. Whereas the first e-cigarette to be designed uh, was called a Sigalike, and it looked almost identical to just a regular cigarette um, because it was meant to be appealing to smokers as a replacement or an adjunct. But quickly, as a set of people became e-cigarette users, uh, they wanted to, these devices to evolve to look different than a cigarette because they wanted to show that they were not smoking conventional tobacco. So our second generation devices were already in play by 2013. Um, and a lot of these are called vape pens. So they have a battery and a tank that holds the liquid and they come in lots of different colors. And then by 2015, box mods were becoming the most popular and they were very large. So the batteries were like the size of a wallet and then a large tank on top. And then the most current generation is the fourth generation e-cigarette. And they come in every shape and size and color uh, that you can think of. 
And these fourth generation e-cigarettes um, are different than the prior three because they have almost 10 times the amount of nicotine in the e-liquid than the prior generations did. That's a really interesting evolution. Thank you for that, Laura. So John, there's several misconceptions about e-cigarettes. Some people say that they are safer. They encourage people to quit smoking. What does the data actually say about this? Well, there's a lot in the public, a lot of public health per, uh, professionals who, who say that. Um, and uh, Public Health England was the first one to come out and say uh, e-cigarettes were 95% safer than cigarettes. And that's, the industry loved that. Um, what they're saying is that um, the, the, the urinary uh, metabolites of nicotine, uh, well, not of nicotine so much, but of, the, uh, of tar and of all the chemicals that uh, are particularly related, like the nitrosamines that are particularly related to, to lung cancer, are reduced. Uh, it's not a combustible product and so they're, they're markedly reduced. But of, the, of all of the smoking-related uh, mortality, uh, lung cancer is only around 26%. Uh, there's there's an, you know, about 27% is uh, COPD, respiratory disease, and, and probably 40% is cardiovascular disease, and they don't have markers of those. So just because the lung cancer is going, is potentially going to be better, uh, reduced, doesn't mean the alternatives are, and they actually might even be increased. And so that's, that's part of the problem. That lung cancer has been the, the, the big target for uh, tobacco control for so long that they just locked in on that and didn't worry about the others. Just to add to that, you know, when they said 95% safer, that was a hypothesis. I mean, that was based on them just looking at the contents on a piece of paper and making that decision. It was not based on data. Right. So tell us a little bit more about your data, Laura. So your research looks at the safety of chemicals that are used in e-cigarettes. What have you found about the nicotine that's in these devices? Absolutely. And you've really hit on one of the top questions. So nicotine is, you know, the driver of use of tobacco, including e-cigarettes, because it's so addictive. Um, it activates the dopamine reward pathways in your brain, just like when you get a like on a Facebook page or you get a text message from your best friend, like that activates that reward pathway with a little burst. Um, nicotine does the same thing. Um, and in the e-cigarettes, what we're seeing is with the extremely high level of nicotine in the most current generation, there's a lot of activation of that pathway um, such that people are not finding joy in other things. So they've actually found that kids are becoming addictive and they used to like to play soccer or play with a puppy, but that can't activate the pathway the same way that high level of nicotine is. So that's one of the concerns and what some research is really focusing in on now. What my work has really been looking for are changes across the body that inhalation of these chemicals, uh, what they cause. So we've talked about, about that word aerosol. So the e-cigarette, the battery heats up a coil that's in this liquid. And that liquid has no water in it, which is a common misconception that it's water vapor. Um, it's actually propylene glycol, which is similar to antifreeze, um, glycerin, and then nicotine are the three big chemicals. And so that's what we've primarily been studying. And they get heated by this coil and then pulled through a mesh to create a particulate cloud, which is an aerosol, but most people call it vapor. So e-cigarette vapor is uh, the common terminology. So in our work, we've exposed mice to these aerosols for days, weeks, months to try and come up with the answers of what use of these e-cigarettes is going to lead to health-wise in the long run. So going back to what John said, you know, the tobacco use in general causes stroke, heart disease, lung disease, just changes across the body, changes in the skin, DNA. 
Um, and so we're really just looking broadly to see what e-cigarettes will do as well. And I've been shocked to see that these mice who are exposed for months, we can find changes in every part of the body that we've looked. So this concept of them being safer because they have fewer chemicals and that they have like a shorter list of known carcinogens, I don't think it's gonna be pan out to be that much safer than conventional tobacco. It's gonna to be different. They're gonna cause different diseases. Yeah, wow. You see, we, we, we took 20, 30 years to be able to identify uh, the, the diseases that were caused by cigarettes. You know, this height, we weren't too, people weren't too worried about the initial e-cigarettes because people didn't stay on them. They weren't, uh, they, they started on them, then they moved over to cigarettes. Um, but these new ones with this high nicotine, people are staying on them, but they've only been around uh, for five years now. Um, and they're being used by 14, 15, 16, 17 year olds. The diseases won't hit them for another 20 years. Uh, and so it's hard to even devise a study which is going to identify them within the next 10 years. Uh, what they, we probably will have it pretty well nailed by then, but, but not until then. Uh, and all the decisions on, on what to allow and what not to allow and uh, uh, what we should do about it, they've got to be made now. Yeah. So talking about decision making, uh, where is the U.S. policy on nicotine in these modern products? Does it align with what's going on in the rest of the world? Uh, well, uh, for e-cigarettes, uh, uh, England only allows um, 20 milligrams uh, in the um, e-cigarette, whereas is what, 59, yep. something like that. Uh, so, you know, that's threefold the level uh, that's, that's allowed in it. And Australia doesn't allow any nicotine in their e-cigarettes at all. I told them to go and test it though, because, yes, <laughs> because, no, absolutely. because everyone's using them. <laughs> oh no, and so, they can get them shipped in from overseas. The, the, uh, I said, you can't trust the industry. Um, and the, but so what is the FDA doing? Uh, the FDA has come out and said they're going to announce a policy to reduce the nicotine in cigarettes. But they didn't even mention e-cigarettes, which is, you know, um, I think what they're saying is one of these pods is worth, the, it's got the same nicotine as a whole pack of cigarettes. Wow. And so people are seeing uh, seeing the same sort of nicotine use behavior that was seen in my father's age when, uh, before we knew about the hazards, when people were smoking every 20 minutes. Uh, and they can use these uh, jewels and, and other products, smoke and, and uh, enjoy, uh, in ways that people can't see them. They don't, doesn't smell, so they can pop them back in. And so they can use them indoors. Uh, and it's been difficult for people to identify that they are being used. Yeah, wow. And I think we'd be excited if the FDA would extend their nicotine concentration limits to the e-cigarette oh, side. Yeah. And as John mentioned, yeah, some of the smaller e-cigarettes, they're equivalent to one pack of cigarettes worth of nicotine. But um, one of the most popular ones right now is called the Flume, the Flume Float. And it holds the equivalent of 13 packs of cigarettes. And um, I recruit human subjects to study and when I'm interviewing them and asking about how many they're using and they'll, they'll go through one per week. So they're using 13 packs of cigarettes per week. So equivalent of two packs per day smokers. So it's really impressive how much they will use these devices because they can just use them continuously. And we know how difficult it is to quit, even at low levels. Uh, at high levels, uh, it, well, I, I think you're going to, uh, I, I struggle. Don't know. Well, I, well, they're going to struggle to quit, but the the other issue is it's going to affect their ability to learn. It's going to affect their ability to do a lot of things uh, at that, that high dose. Yeah. So, Laura, um, what are you finding in your research about the effects of the use of these products on brain and GI tract? Our most recent study um, found that in the brain of mice that had used for a month, which is the equivalent of several years in a human, 
or a mouse that had uh, inhaled these aerosols for three months, which is the equivalent of a couple decades. Um, and as John mentioned, we use these mice because they can give us an idea of what's gonna happen in the long run. We found the inflammation in the brain, especially in these areas where you form memories and where your mood is controlled. And so it's very worrisome for these e-cigarettes to cause changes in behavior and mood, such as anxiety, depression. Um, so that's the main brain findings we found. And then in the GI tract, so the colon in particular, we found a lot of inflammation in the wall of the GI tract. And what this looks like is inflammatory bowel disease of which you know many people are affected and this looks like it's gonna be a driver e-cigarette use. And another concerning part of that is when your GI tract, when the wall is not really well sealed, it allows the stuff in the lumen, such as the bacteria that we're colonized with, you know, our food, the processing, to cross over into the bloodstream and sort of drive inflammation across the body. So we were really sort of shocked by those findings um, and find them very concerning. Yeah. So John, you know, we've heard some really concerning things about the use of e-cigarettes on human health. And you've spent your career, you know, thinking about health policy and health policy in the space of tobacco and nicotine use. What has been happening recently with the government what kind of actions are they starting to take to curb the use of e-cigarettes? The people have been pretty excited because uh, e-cigarette use has been has come down uh, in the uh, 18 to 21 year old group uh, over the last few years. But there's not a policy that was driving that. Uh, there was Ivali. <laughs> Uh, Ivali being the e-cigarette, uh, what is it? E-cigarette or vaping product use associated lung injury, which is why we don't say it That's that right. way, we say <laughs> Ivali. Uh, and, but e-cigarettes is in there at the front end of it. Um, and uh, in 2019, uh, there was serious lung injury being caused in, in many young people, particularly 18 to 21 year old, age group and a lot of deaths and uh, it scared a lot of people uh, and so uh, I think that's the main reason uh, people got off using them uh, back then uh, but that's not what's been happening in the kids in school that's still been increasing uh, and so um, Ivali now is a thing of the past and the new population don't know anything about it and so we're back on a rise. So I, I think it's, it's false hope to say that these cigarettes have been going down. Yeah. So L Laura, can you talk a little bit about flavorants? Sure. And their importance in really promoting public health in this context. Um, and to follow up on John's point, the E-Valley epidemic of 2019 was really due to vaping of THC, so tetrahydrocannabinoids. So we mainly are talking about here of the vaping of nicotine and e-cigarettes as a general umbrella of vaping of nicotine. But that epidemic was really a vaping of uh, THC. It was vitamin E acetate, right? In it was the a THC product that was put liquids. in it. Yes. yes, exactly. So how I would mention that there's propylene glycol, glycerin, nicotine are the main three in e-cigarettes containing nicotine. THC has completely different chemical properties, and so you have to put it in with chemicals that keep it in solution. And it turns out that vitamin E acetate uh, works really well, and it looks very similar. And so we think that dealers were cutting the vitamin E, the, using the vitamin E acetate to cut the THC in those vapes. And we're hoping that that's really exited the market. A side point, is that E-Valley is continuing in nicotine vapors, but it's much more patchy and individual. And as you mentioned, like flavors might be a big driver here because um, there's thousands of different flavors and companies will design a flavor by just pulling a few chemicals, putting them together and seeing if that's appealing to a user. And so hundreds of different chemicals are being used 
And some of them are even approved for ingestion through the GI tract, but like none of them have been studied in the lungs. And this is where we ran into trouble with that vitamin E acetate, because you can put it on your skin, you can eat it, you're gonna be fine. But if you inhale it, it turns out that it's highly toxic to the lungs. So we're in this situation where all of these companies are creating these flavors. There's no regulation of what chemicals are allowed in, and we simply have no idea what these flavors are gonna do inside the lungs. When we've studied them in a dish and put like cinnamon, apple, chocolate, banana, tobacco flavor uh, in with a bunch of different human cells, uh, we found pretty impressive cytotoxicity so that they kill cells, they change the behavior. So we do feel like flavors themselves are going to be one of the drivers of uh, disease, but it's really hard to predict. Um, which one is going to cause what, because there's so many options. Yeah, but there's, the good news is the states have stepped up. Mm. So in, in California in particular, and um, you know, we, we've had ordinances banning flavoring uh, in the major cities. Uh, the, uh, the state actually banned it and uh, the industry put a referendum on and that's coming this November. Uh, on whether flavoring should be allowed or not. Uh, but at the moment, uh, even if that doesn't pass, and we, we hope that that won't happen. We, I mean, there's, there's a strong uh, sense in the public health area that we've got to stop these flavors uh, because they're large particles, much larger than, uh, than should be inhaled into the lung. Uh, and they, they have all of these effects that we can see coming as well. Plus, they are the main, uh, one of the main uh, reasons kids are taking them on because yep. they want they want these flavors. And we had a nice evidence of that. The uh, FDA uh, got Juul to remove all their flavors. And Juul had 75% of the market when that happened. One year later, they had 25. Uh, people just bolted from from Juul and to, to other disposables that gave them flavors. Like icy uh, blueberry and red hots yeah. and cinnamon cupcakes. So yes, flavors are a main driver of why people are picking these up and using them. Yeah, sounds like a treat. Yes. Right? So let's talk a little bit more about Juul, right? We learned in June of 2022 that the FDA denied authorization of Juul products. And it really is sort of reviving this interest in the uh, public health fight against e-cigarettes. Why did the FDA deny this authorization? We're not privy to what the FDA has. Um, the market authorizations, uh, the FDA gave all uh, products uh, five years to, de to put those in. Uh, and uh, so, they, it's like a closed bid on something. They, they, they make the case for why they should be allowed to market their product. Um, and the FDA approved two high nicotine e-cigarettes, much to the chagrin of a lot of people. Uh, but Juul, they denied. Uh, and their, their, their statement said there was leakage in the pods or there was, uh, there was, there was there was inconsistency in the evidence they presented, and so they, they banned it. But as you know, uh, they quickly turned around and allowed it to keep going while they review more uh, because of the political pressure that happened. And uh, we were amazed the other day that uh, one of the top FDA people left and went and joined Philip Morris. Oh. So. Um, <laughs> It's awkward. So, awkward yeah. because he knows every all the thinking that was going in from the FDA, much etc. So for twenty years, right? Yeah, He'd, he was their top person. Yeah, that's very interesting, right? We talk about public-private partnerships and government-private partnerships, etc., but it becomes um, we have a mandate really to manage through these potential conflicts. And um, but there's been a history of people in especially communication positions in the White House, uh, getting vice presidencies in uh, R.J. Reynolds or Philip Morris, 
I mean, that goes back 40 years. Uh, and it's, uh, so uh, it's shocking that someone was still willing to take that sort of a position. But we do hope that the conflict of interest paperwork is very solid, <laughs> but we're very worried. We should that get public access not. to that for sure. <laughs> so interestingly, uh, tobacco and traditional cigarettes fall under different guidelines. Why is that, John? When these cigarettes came in uh, at the beginning, uh, there was a, a, a strong hope or desire that they would be better. Uh, and you know, this goes, this is not a new thing, okay? Um, in, in 1954, with all of the negative press coming from the first examples of cancer, the, the industry came out with filters, the safe product. They already knew filters didn't work. They had all the evidence for it, which came out in the tobacco industry documents that got leaked. And, and they had the evidence they didn't work, but people believed they worked. And so everyone started smoking filters. And so um, then in 1978-79, and um, there was um, this safe cigarette, a, a big movement. The NCI uh, led it. Led it and, and, uh, but some, well, you've got to understand, the public health professionals have been in the field for such a long time. Ern, Ernst Winder, who was one was the major person in the US to push uh, the tobacco control uh, approach and to identify uh, cancer from smoking. In 1978, he was fed up with an inability to get people to quit. They were unable, the quit rates are so low that he wanted a safe cigarette. He, he said, well, we can't stop them smoking, let's get us a safe. So he tried to work with the industry on it and they came up with low tar and low nicotine. And uh, 20 years later, uh, it, it got stopped and it didn't go further. And the person who stopped it was Joe Califano. Uh, and Joe Califano's son is our, the medical director of our cancer center here at, at UCSD. Uh, but, but 20 years later, we identified that what changed was the type of lung cancer. <laughs> it, it didn't change lung cancer per se. It, it actually was more deadly than, than the previous versions. And so, so uh, people at the start of e-cigarettes, there's another generation have come, they've been trying to help people to quit with very little success. Uh, and th so they jumped on this uh, when Public Health England came out and said, 95% lower. The, uh, the nitrosamines are lower in the urine. That means it, it's going to be safer. Let's get everybody on. They jumped on it. Uh, and so you had some of the senior leaders in public health tobacco control promoting e-cigarettes as the, as the answer. And so they, they had a, they weren't, a, they, they advocated strongly that they not have the same rules. Yeah. Well, you know, this is, raises an interesting point because given the misconceptions, given the attractiveness to our youth uh, based on flavorants, et cetera, and thinking about the marketing and advertising that goes in play with that, um, one of the key protective measures for public health is likely to be intervening on this type of advertising. And so, Laura, can you tell us a little bit about how social media comes into play here? Why might social media be a real facilitator to us um, rethinking adv advertising strategies, particularly to youth? Absolutely, because um, you know the tobacco playbook is very well known in terms of placing advertisements near schools, um, anywhere kids are going to be, make them sexy, make them cool. And so if you look at the e-cigarette advertisements, you know, from 2010 to 2018, really, they did all those things. So they had young people like partying. Um, so they had those, they were allowed to put them in magazines, other places, but in the same era of social media, a lot of young people, you know, they don't look at magazines. They don't look, you know, even at the TV, they're on uh, Instagram, TikTok, um, Facebook, and, 
the e-cigarette companies actually would hire influencers. So they'd get people who have a huge number of followers to start talking about how cool e-cigarettes were, how they great they made them feel, how safe they were. To model them. Yes, yeah. to model them. But so the, the BAT, which is one of the big tobacco industries, after the Juul campaign came out, they, they put a $1 billion amount in their budget to purchase influencers yep. wow. on social media. Wow. Because they know it works, and this is a way to reach our kids from 10 to 30, really. Um, and this is the best way to get them, is through their friends and the people that they admire. So it's been very interesting. And as you know, we've been glad that advertising in more normal areas has been banned. It's a little bit harder to control the influencer sort of state of being. Yeah. And public health, unfortunately, doesn't have that kind of budget. No, it doesn't. Uh, and uh, the question is, uh, does it need to have a budget like that? Uh, uh, when something is that influential, you can stop it. Uh, this is product placement going on. We took, product, we took cigarettes out of movies or out of a lot of movies. They're not out of all of them. They're actually still in them. But we took the, the actual, uh, the Superman used to have the Coca-Cola things and the Marlboro ads and uh, clearly in them. Uh, they, they're not there anymore. Uh, and so uh, that too can be done with social media. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit more about why the focus on e-cigarettes, given that we know there's harm also with tobacco and traditional cigarettes, why is it so important in this moment in history to really be thinking about Juul and some of these other products? Well, I mean, the history of, uh, of nicotine use uh, is all about initiation because it's so hard to quit that, it, you know, that's like the they say the California the Hotel, everyone checks in and no one checks out, right? It's, a, uh, it's so hard to get people to quit. So it all becomes on, it comes into initiation. And so initiation occurs only under the age of 24 years. No, I shouldn't say only, 98% uh, of anyone who becomes a regular user has used by the time they're 24 with, uh, with probably 85% first trying under the age of 18. Uh, and that hasn't changed. Uh, so I was saying what's happened in high schools on smoking. It went from 30% down to 6% in the last 20 years, a huge decline. So the industry is gonna be out of business if this keeps up. So in, when we had, when they got it right and they started the big takeoff with Juul and the, the high nicotine cigarettes in 2017, and they've got it back up to 30% of the young people. That's why uh, we're focused on it. Because e-cigarettes is the industry's way to keep people addicted to nicotine. So let's link this back to public health. And maybe Laura, you can start here. Um, what are some of the tools that we have in public health to help with this clear problem of people quitting or the inability to quit? And what do we do when we have such a low quit rate for harm reduction, right? We've seen some things tried that haven't been um, as optimal as we'd like for them to be. What are the public health options here? I'm a VA clinician, so most of our patients in our lung clinic, you know, are smokers or ex-smokers. And those who have been smokers, you know, for 60 years, they've tried everything for the most part. So they've tried gum, the nicotine inhalers, and the oral medications, the uh, groups. So we have a lot of tools in play, and most of the time people have to try to quit like over 10 times before they're successful. So a lot of what we're doing is just, you know, encouraging them, you know, you know, helping them, supporting them, and, you know, making sure that they're aware of all these different tools. And there's like several very powerful tobacco cessation programs at, you know, local hospital levels, 
uh, system levels, state levels. Um, so I think there are a lot of things that can help. For the e-cigarette side, you know, very little has been studied in terms of helping people quit. Um, and since a large number of the people who we are trying to help quit are children and teenagers and young adults, there's even less information and in how exactly to help them. But John, I'll see if- Well, it's, uh, to quote Xu Hong Zhu, who's a, um, a tobacco researcher, he set up the California Smokers Helpline. Um, Xu Hong said, to, used to say to people who come in and said, well, you know, how, how ready are you to quit? Oh, I'm going to try, they'd say, well, um, well, do you think if I gave you a million dollars, you'd be successful? Oh, absolutely. And he said, well, then we've just shown its motivation, isn't it? Uh, and so why, why is motivation in nicotine not as high, uh, to quit nicotine, not as high as it is for heroin and cocaine? Because what we know is people who get addicted don't come off them uh, at a much higher rate than, than cigarette smoking uh, or, or nicotine use of other sorts. Uh, and the reason is because those other products make it impossible to work. Uh, and so uh, your whole social functioning goes down. And so if you want to be fu a functioning human again, uh, you need to get off them. But nicotine doesn't. So nicotine, uh, people can work uh, addicted to nicotine. You can't work addict you know, t too well if you're uh, an alcoholic, uh, but you can if, if, you're, if you're addicted to nicotine. So, so the problem is that it doesn't have the social consequences of the others. And so that's why uh, you've got to be really motivated to do it. And people get motivation often when they get disease, and, but not always. <laughs> About half of them stop when they, they get one of the diseases they've been scared of getting most of their life uh, because they know the risks. They, they know what the diseases are they just think they don't have to stop just yet. Uh, and so it's very insidious, the, uh, the role at, of nicotine. And you can go back and say it's the reward system, it's motivating, and right. uh, these, that, these, are the reason, these are the physiological reasons for it. Uh, but socially, they just very are very difficult to do it. And along those same lines, you mentioned that most people have initiated before the age of 25. And to me, that means like the brain is developing up until that age. And we know that when you activate that reward pathway, you fundamentally change the way the brain will respond to other stimuli. So that sort of fits together, you know, really nicely. One thing I think that the public doesn't know that much about is that tobacco does cause anxiety and depression. So a lot of people reach for a cigarette because they feel like it calms them down and it treats their anxiety, but they don't realize in the long run, it actually drives anxiety and depression. And that's another thing that we're really worried about on the e-cigarette side because it's activating those same pathways. So when you ask, like, you know, why are we so worried about e-cigarettes? It's because, you know, it is a gateway into tobacco use, nicotine addiction. We believe that these people are going to be addicted for decades and that inhaling this cloud of chemicals containing the nicotine itself is going to drive a multitude of disease. And to circle back to cancer in particular, so nicotine, um, does look like it is a driver itself of the process that leads to cancer. And uh, inhaling it might have different consequences than uh, getting it through other routes. And so a lot of work still needs to be done there. Um, and so far on the e-cigarette side, when we have looked at different cancer, mo cancer models, the e-cigarette inhalation looks like it is driving uh, tumorigenesis, so cancer development and cancer growth. So, you know, even though a lot of people, you know, believe it to be safer and that, you know, really hoping that the cancer being driven by regular cigarettes is not going to happen to the same degree, um, there is a lot of concern that, you know, the chemicals inside the e-cigarettes are going to drive it anyway, but it might be different cancers. 
You know, nicotine is not harmless. Nicotine is probably one of our most effective uh, horticultural pesticides. <laughs> uh, and so, so it's a poison <laughs> and it's marked that way. Um, and yet we uh, allow it to be smoked. Uh, and we're, we're putting it at very high concentrations in, in products that our kids are using. Uh, I mean, it's unconscionable. Well, you know, you've talked a lot about, again, the things that we are hearing that are misinformation around this product. And we also know that there's a great deal of data around the potential harms of e-cigarettes, the known harms of tobacco use, and a population level strategy is really necessary here. If you had the ear of the FDA, what policies might you recommend to them and how might you include the strategies that might be necessary to address any barriers to implementing those policies? If you could tell them this is what needs to get done, what would you say? I have a top two. I don't know. You, you probably have a it. top ten. You go for it. <laughs> I think the first thing is really the banning of all flavors except for tobacco because e-cigarettes are here to stay. They're always going to be allowed, but we can limit it to tobacco flavor. And that's going to include menthol flavor because they've already started the ban on menthol and conventional tobacco, which is fantastic because that's been a driver of tobacco use uh, in uh, certain populations. And so on the e-cigarette side, we need to get rid of all fruity, sweet flavors so that we stop them being appealing to children, adolescents, women, uh, different ethnic groups. The second request would be to drop the nicotine concentration that's allowed in the e-liquids um, from where it is at 59 milligrams per mil uh, down to like less than 20 at least um, to try and make them less addictive. And a piece of information that really might play into this is that Juul was, you know, our top e-cigarette, dominated the market because it had this 59 milligrams per mil concentration. If you look at Juul in the UK, because they could only sell it at 19 milligrams per mil, it never took off. It was never, you know, popular. And so even just dropping it by that two thirds might have a dramatic input on impact on people picking it up. Well, I mean, it was the 59 milligram one and higher in, in these that took off the, the market here in the US and they dropped most of the others. They still have lower versions on and, and typically uh, what happened, the only ones who were using the very high nicotine doses were the kids. The smokers who were trying to quit didn't want them. They, they were too high. It's much more than they were getting out of the cigarettes, I think. Uh, and so, it, and so we, when we looked in 2017 with the surge in these products, it was only in kids. The adults were using the lower nicotine version of it. Uh, Which so is a great point because yeah. uh, the cigarette smokers, sorry, uh, you know, one it. of the things <laughs> that they really want, they want the e-cigarette access. They want to have uh, access to a potentially safer one. So what we would say is that the lower nicotine concentration should still be appealing yeah. to the adult uh, smokers. Yeah. So, so yes. Uh, we can so the FDA could move easily on the nicotine, uh, and uh, basically they'd have to adopt what England has done. Mm -hmm. Now I know that might be a bit <laughs> of a problem for them, but the uh, flavourings, of course, are the other things. But the FDA has done has has not approved uh, nearly a hundred thousand, probably over a hundred thousand now products that were put up as new products. Uh, it's it has approved a couple, uh, the uh, the Enjoy and the uh, the Vuz, uh, which are high nicotine products, and uh, that was a bit shocking to me that they did that. Although they said that they're going to keep studying them, and if they show they're attractive to kids, they're going to revisit it. Okay, uh, I yeah, well. We'll see uh, if they do that. That's not normally how it works. Once you let them in, they're very hard to, to change. Uh, but the other thing is, if they do not allow Juul to come forward, uh, people who are currently Juul users uh, 
who want to uh, uh, have a dual product, they could switch to one of these others. Uh, so that's potentially how they may be looking at it. Uh, but uh, no, I, I think flavorings is the, is the key uh, to this. This is driving a lot of the kids to doing it and nicotine's the other one. And you take that out and then the, you'll have a product that is not attractive to kids, but is probably still attractive to a lot of smokers trying to quit or reducing the harm. So thank you, Dr. Laura Crotty Alexander and Dr. John Pierce. They are world-renowned scientists in the area of tobacco cessation, tobacco policy, and e-cigarette science. We're very fortunate here in San Diego to have scientists such as John and Laura working in our region, working on data and policy efforts that will impact our state, our nation, as well as the globe. As you've heard, E-cigarette use is a major public health challenge for the 21st century, and your work, thank you so much, is going to hopefully have the kind of impact that we need on individual behavior change as well as population level strategies so that we can curb this ever important public health challenge. Thank you again.